Kotlin collections. You've heard of them, you've used them, now it's time to learn even more about them. The standard library provides awesome tools to manage groups of items, and we're going to take a closer look. In today's episode, we'll see what types of collections the Kotlin standard library offers, and we'll explore a common subset of operations that is available for all of the collections you get in the standard library. Let's get started. In the standard library, we have three big types of collections. We have lists, sets, and maps. Just like many other parts of the standard library, these collections are available anywhere you can write Kotlin, on the JVM, but also on Kotlin native, Kotlin JS, and common Kotlin code. Let's start with the most popular candidate of a collection in Kotlin, that is a list. You probably already have an intuitive understanding of what a list is, but let's just rehearse it for a second. A list is a collection of ordered elements. What does that mean? It really just means that you can access the elements of a list using indices. So you can say, give me the element at position two. There's also no constraints on duplicate elements in our list. We can just put in whatever elements we'd like. So very few constraints on content and maximum versatility in how we access the elements. No wonder it's a fan favorite. Next up, we have sets. Sets are groups of objects where we don't care so much about the order of elements. Instead, we want to make sure that our collection never contains any duplicates. That's the key property of a set. All of the contents are unique. That makes sets a bit more of a specialized data structure, but there's a good chance you want to use them in everyday scenarios anyway. Because what are typical things you might want to store in a set? tags, for example, or maybe you're building a social network and you want to store the IDs of all the friends that a certain user has. In both cases, having duplicates in these collections doesn't really make a lot of sense, and the order also doesn't really matter. A set can help you enforce these constraints without having to really think about it or do manual duplication checks. Sets are actually also a common mathematical abstraction, and once we take some time to put sets under our magnifying glass, we'll see that typical mathematical concepts like unions, intersections, or the set difference translate quite nicely into Kotlin code. Last but certainly not least, we have maps. A map is a set of key value pairs, with each key being unique. It's also sometimes referred as a dictionary for that reason. You encounter maps whenever you're associating data, storing a person's name and their favorite pizza topping, or associating a license plate with vehicle information. Key value pairs are everywhere, and just like many other languages, maps are the go-to way to manage them in Kotlin. Now, by default, all collections in Kotlin are read-only. This is in the spirit of immutability, which accompanies typical functional paradigms. Instead of changing the contents of a collection, you create a new collection with the changes applied, which you can then safely pass around all in your application without having to worry about consumers modifying the original collection. But we also have mutable flavors of all of the collections in Kotlin. We have mutable list, mutable set, and mutable map. Those are modifiable, meaning you can comfortably add and remove elements. With data where you're inherently expecting change, you'd probably use these mutable variants. Collections in Kotlin are also all iterable. What this basically means is that the Kotlin standard library provides a common standardized set of typical operations for collections, for example, to retrieve their size, check if they contain a certain item, and more. Lists and sets directly implement the collection interface, which in turn implements the iterable interface. And maps have an iterator operator function and provide iterable properties like their set of keys, their list of values, as well as the entries of the map, so key value pairs. Now that we know that all collections share a set of versatile functions, let's get started and learn about some of them. My examples are going to use a list, but really you can just assume that we're working with an iterable here. We don't care about the concrete implementation. And all the functions we'll discuss here leave the original collection unchanged. The easiest way to go through all the elements in a collection is actually the basic Kotlin for loop. When we use the for loop with an iterable, the in operator cleverly understands that we want to go over the iterator. And in a more functional style spirit, we can also write the same snippet using the for each function. In this case, for each takes every element from our collection and calls a function which we provide with the element as its argument. It makes a lot of sense, given its name. Well, now that we've already touched on the first function we can call on a collection, we might as well continue. And what better candidate than the classic when it comes to transforming collections? The map function. First, don't be confused. The map function has nothing to do with the map collection type. You can treat them as two completely separate things. 
Just like the for each function, the map function is of higher order. So it takes each element from our collection, it applies a function to it, and then creates another collection which contains the return values of those function applications. The result of the map function doesn't have to be the same type as the one of our input collection either. This makes the map function very versatile. Whether you want to parse a collection of strings into a collection of integers, or resolve a list of usernames to a list of full user profiles, if you're transforming one collection into another, it's probably a good first instinct to think map. However, you might have a transformation inside your map function where you can't generate valid results for all input elements. We can use the map not null function and our resulting collection will only contain those function results that evaluate it to an actual value. If we need to keep track of the index of the element which we're currently transforming, we can use the map index function. It's quite similar in how it works, but in this case, we get two parameters to work with, the index and the value, and we can use those two to create our transformation. But what if we have a collection, but we're only interested in elements that fulfill a certain condition? The filter function comes to the rescue. Uh, just like the previous examples, filter accepts another function as its parameter, but this time, instead of transforming a transformation, we're defining what you can call a predicate here. Simply said, a predicate is a function that takes a collection element and returns a boolean value. True means that the given element matches the predicate, false means the opposite. So this predicate acts as kind of the doorman. If a value is true, then the collection item is let through to the result collection, otherwise it is sent away, it is discarded. If you're testing a negative condition, you can use the filter not function instead, which behaves identically but inverts the condition. Note that both filter and filter not discard elements where the condition doesn't match. But maybe we don't want to discard the other half of elements and instead we want to put those into a separate list. This is where the partition function comes into play. By using partition, we combine the powers of filter and filter not because it returns a pair of lists where the first list contains all the elements for which the predicate holds true and the second contains all the elements that fail the test. So in our dormant analogy, instead of sending people who fail the check away, uh, we just send them to a different place. If you are bringing a collection of nullable items to the party, you can use the filter not null function, uh, which as you may have guessed, automatically discards any elements that are null and gives you a new collection with an adjusted non-nullable type accordingly. And speaking of adjusting types, if your collection contains multiple elements from a type hierarchy, but you're only interested in elements of a specific type, you can use filter is instance and specify the desired type as a generic parameter. So filtering allows us to apply a predicate function and create a new collection containing items that match. But what about even simpler cases? Sometimes we just wanna grab a few elements and do something with them. For that, we have the take and drop functions. You might already be able to guess what they do. Take gives you a collection of the first n elements from your original connection. So take two is going to give you the first two elements. And on the opposite side, drop three is going to leave out the first three elements of your original collection and only gives you everything that follows after those three elements. And you don't have to be afraid to overdrop either. Dropping more elements from a collection than it contains just gives you an empty list. Can't throw away what you don't have, that kind of thing. One huge benefit of the functions we've seen so far is their composability. Because mapping, filtering, taking, dropping, and all their friends return a new collection, it's easy to just take that result and immediately pump it into the next function, turning collection into collection into collection. However, we should keep in mind that chaining a number of these functions together means we generate a bunch of intermediate collections. Now, this isn't going to set your computer on fire immediately, but it's still something to be aware of, especially when you work with very large collections. For this case, Kotlin actually has a few aces up its sleeve called sequences, but that'll be part of a future video. <laughs> anyway, once we're done transforming our data, we might want to get a single result value out of it. If we have collections of numerical values like integers or doubles, we can get some nice functions called average and sum out of the box, which help us calculate those values. In some situations, get it, some situations, we have a collection of more complex objects and still want to add them up somehow based on their properties. Of course, we could first use the map function to obtain a collection containing only numbers, but by using the sum of function, we can do all of this in a single function call. 
in the same pattern we've seen numerous times today, we can pass a function that acts as a selector, so a function that gives us whatever number we want to associate with the element, and sum of will use the result of that selector function to add up all our elements. If we're only interested in the greatest or smallest values contained in our collection of numbers, we can use the max or null and min or null functions. We have the sibling functions max off and min off, but we can once again pass a selector function, which is going to be used to determine the maximum and minimum of our collection. And if we just care about the number of elements contained in our collection, we can use the count function, either without any parameters to just get the number of all elements or using a predicate. So that's like filtering the collection first and then counting the elements, but again, all wrapped into one. And there's also the powerful join to string function, which allows us to turn all elements of our collection into a combined string, complete with a metric ton of customization options like separators, prefixes and postfixes, limits, or a placeholder if you have more elements than what your specified limit allows. And even join to string accepts a transformation function once again, so you don't have to do some kind of separate mapping beforehand. It's all built in. Truly powerful stuff to create a string from a collection. And by the way, you know that we've talked about strings before, right? If you want to refresh what kind of magic we can do with Kotlin strings, I have a simple suggestion. Watch the episode that takes us into the depths of strings, which is probably linked somewhere on screen. So that was an overview of Kotlin collections. In the next episode, we are going to step up our game even more and we'll take a look at some advanced collection functionality because some of the functions we've seen today actually have some additional variants to them which I'd like to introduce to all of you. And there's also a whole world of modifying collections. Oh, and each type of collection we've seen, lists, sets, and maps, they all have their own specialized functionality as well. So yeah, we're in for a whole bunch more Kotlin collection content. Make sure you don't miss it. To get reminded of new stuff when it comes up on the channel, you make sure where to find the subscribe button and you know where to find the notification bell. But if you don't want to wait until that episode comes out, there's only one solution. You may have already guessed it. It's time for you to go and explore some more Carlin. See you in the next one.